The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, coming to you from our broadcast uh, station and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, X Zone at X Zone Radio TV dot com on all social media sites, X Zone Radio TV. And if you'd like to check out the programming we have available for you on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www dot dot net. And of course, we're being brought to you around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, X Zone Broadcast Network, and iHeart Radio. Wow, you know this this is a this hour is going to be an hour that you're just going to sit there and say, hmm, kind of figured, but I didn't think. That would be the truth. And we're talking about a, a book that's uh, out there now calling Blowing America's Mind. And it's a true story of Princeton, CIA, mind-controlled, LSD, and Zen by John Selby and Paul Jeffrey Davids. And our guest tonight is Paul Jeffrey Davids. Um, he is a noted producer, writer, and director in Los Angeles, mainly of television films that have been released by Showtime, Roswell, The UFO Cover-Up, and NBC Universal International. He's also written books including An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death. Paul is from Bethesda, Maryland, the son of a famous Georgetown University professor of American history, Dr. Jules Davids, who worked extensively with a JFK on the writing of Profiles in Courage, for which his father is credited in the preference, and who was a professor to Jacqueline Kennedy, and later to Georgetown undergraduate Bill Clinton. At Princeton, Paul won numerous awards in writing, including the F. Scott Fitzgerald Prize for Short Story Writing. His misadventures uh, working at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute while he was a student at Princeton are fully documented in the book Blowing America's Mind, A True Story of Princeton, CIA Mind Control, LSD and Zen. Joining me now is Paul Jeffrey Davids. And Paul, welcome back to the X Zone. Hi, Rob. Good evening. Thank you for the introduction. Oh, it's our pleasure. Um, tell us a little bit about this book. What was the inspiration for the uh, for the writing of Blowing America's Mind? Well, there were two inspirations. First is a, a uh, historic fact that uh, beginning in the 1950s and extending well into the 1970s, at least the CIA embarked on research in mind control using drugs and hypnosis. It was all exposed in the late 1970s. So the information came out about 149 projects mm -hmm. that they had initiated at 86 institutions, which included colleges, universities, hospitals, prisons, and research centers like the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute. So that was a factual a historic basis. But the motivation, the reason that John Selby and I got together to write the book was that when we were students at Princeton in the late 1960s, and we were psychology majors, we both enlisted to work at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute in their research, <clears throat> which I was very naive at the time. Mm -hmm. I stumbled upon the ad for it on a kiosk on Nassau Street in Princeton. It talked about needing subjects for deep hypnosis research. And I realized quickly that the head of the program, Dr. Humphrey Osmond, was a very famous man in LSD research, in psychedelic research. And in fact, a little research will show you that Humphrey Osmond coined the term psychedelic in the first place. 
Uh, I was interested in LSD, but uh, didn't want to, uh, you know, sort of do it illicitly on my own. And I saw an opportunity to have experience with that and deep hypnosis and learn what I could from it uh, with uh, accomplished and experienced researchers like Dr. Osmond. Right. I signed up. John Selby had already been part of the program for a year. <clears throat> he was at a stage where they were making him a training hypnotist, and they were planning on taking him on as a full-time hypnotist after he graduated. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we knew nothing about the true purposes of the experiments, the fact that it was CIA-funded, it was part of MK Ultra, mm -hmm. the fact that there was a darker uh, aspect and goal uh, to some aspects of the research, uh, completely naive and the book that we wrote tells what it was like to be inside our skin at that time and be part of it. It, it, it gives you, it's a recreation, let's say, of the mental atmosphere of what it was like to be part of that. All male Princeton, undergraduate, New Jersey neuropsych, which was like uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest for real. Right. And we wanted to write a book that wasn't like a dry nonfiction um, treatise about MK Ultra. That's not what it is, although it has plenty of documentary support, articles, headlines, things like that. But we wanted to give you the subject of reality in novel like form, but all true and based on what really happened. So you could feel what it was like to live through what we lived through, which was a once in a lifetime, extraordinary, not to be repeated experience. What was the ultimate goal of MK Ultra? Well, that's a big one, because they had many goals, uh, Rob. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have to realize MKUltra grew out of the paranoia at, around the time of the Korean War mm -hmm. of uh, mind control. We all know the story of the Manchurian candidate and the search for the perfect assassin. Yeah. Uh, but also, Russia was doing research at that time in mind control, <clears throat> even in remote viewing and psychic uses of mind control. And the CIA was not to be outdone. They started their own programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. These were expanded. Mm -hmm. When we got to, I think, 1964, when Richard Helms took over the CIA, uh, they had a list of about 140 drugs they were testing, sometimes on completely unsuspecting people. There are, there's documentation of them spraying LSD in a subway car, see what would happen to the people. Um, but, um, in, um, in our case, well, oh, going back to the drugs, the research, they were looking for drugs that could be, for example, a perfect truth serum for interrogation. Mm -hmm. Could they find a drug that would make enemy soldiers lay down their weapons on the battlefield? You know, they, they found in testing LSD and there's documentary footage on this from the army that soldiers given this. It wouldn't take orders. You know, a commanding officer yep. would give an order. They're doing an experiment. The uh, endless D is under LSD. And instead of following the order, he says to the commanding officer, you do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So so uh, the question was, could this be effective uh, as a warfare agent? And they were mainly interested in LSD, not for its extraordinary uh, mind-awakening um, possibilities, right? But for its disruptive uh, possibilities, a very narrow approach to it. Wasn't there also experimentation with mind control uh, by the CIA in Fort Benning, Georgia? I can't speak to uh, Fort Benning, uh, Georgia. Okay, but I can speak to your hometown, Rob. You're you're broadcasting out of Ontario. Yes, I am. Toronto. Uh, well, oh, wait, yeah. wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's Montreal. McGill is in Montreal. Well, uh, let right? me let me tell you about. McGill and the Allen Memorial Institute, because I know this firsthand because my mother, God bless her, was a victim of MKUltra. Really? Okay. She went to the Allen Memorial Institute, which is part of the McGill University learning, uh, learning schools, at the, you know, at the suggestion of her, her family doctor for migraine headaches that she was getting. There she met a Dr. Ewan Cameron. Cameron, yes. Yeah. Yes. And my mother was up at the Allen as a day, a day patient for, uh, for, I believe, four or five months. And every night when she would come home, a nurse would come with her. 
And, you know, at the time, we didn't add one and one together. Like, who would ever think that the CIA was operating at McG- in Canada, at, in at Canada on mind control? Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, it was later on uh, that my mother had to go for further examinations and testing that it was discovered that she was part of the MK Ultra. She even received a letter of apology from Dr. Ewan Cameron. And um, she tried to get compensation being part of the, the, the class action suit against the Canadian government. And, of course, that was shot down very fast. But, Rob, there was hmm. a class action suit in that case against yes. the CIA itself. Yes, there was. And there yeah. were payments made eventually. But not everybody got paid. That not was just it. Not everybody got yeah. paid. And, uh, you know, I, I'm looking yeah. at a list right here of mm-hmm. things that uh, Donald Ca- things that Donald Cameron did in that McGill University study. Yeah, and um, people who came in with minor anxiety disorders, mm-hmm. and it sounds like your mother may have been in that category. Yeah. Um, he tried reprogramming them using electric shock. Yep. Yeah. Psychic driving, mm-hmm. which is like keeping somebody up forever and playing loud music in their ear the whole yeah. time. Drug induced comas, mm-hmm. and more. Dr. Cameron is, as uh, history records, one of the most notorious of the psychiatrists who was enlisted to participate in all of these uh, programs. Stand by, my friend. You and I have to take our first commercial break. Paul uh, Davids is our special guest at Nation. We're talking about Blowing America's Mind, a true story of Princeton, CIA, Mind Control, LSD, and Zen. The website is blowingamericasmind.com. This exonation, I know from personal experience, is fact, definitely not fiction. We'll be back. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of the Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, and armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Wilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X-Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, X-Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk.
ExoNation, my guest this hour is Paul Jeffrey Davids. He, along with John Salvi, have written a must-read for one and all. It's entitled Blowing America's Mind, a true story of Princeton, CIA mind control, LSD, and Zen. It's published by our good friends at Warwick. And if you'd like to find out more about our guest to this hour, Paul Jeffrey Davids or John Selby, or the book we're talking about, Blowing America's Mind, visit www.blowingamericasmind.com. All right, so tell me, um, how did... How was MK Ultra discovered and exposed? It almost never was because Richard Helms, when mm-hmm. head of the CIA, had given the order to the man he had uh, appointed to head all these projects, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, right. had given the order that all the documents should be destroyed. We don't know why they weren't because, uh, well, certainly Dr. Gottlieb wouldn't have had a motivation to disobey that order. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact is that about 10 years later, there were boxes discovered in Langley, Virginia, at the CIA headquarters, that uh, about 20 of them, as I recall, that uh, were marked as financial documents for some unrelated project not having to do with MKUltra. And someone uh, going through these things uh, checked about it, and there were 20 boxes of documents about the MKUltra program there that survived. Mm-hmm. Now, by the time this happened, Helms was out at the CIA, and uh, Jimmy Carter was president. He had appointed Stansfield Turner as head of the CIA. So Mm -hmm. his new administration wants to wash their hands of everything that happened before. Uh, Not their fault, of course, right? Of course. Um, And those whose fault it was, like Richard Helms, who was called before Congress to testify about things including, I think, Iran-Contra and lied to Congress. He, you know, he, he was severely punished, uh, Rob, by Congress. They fined him $1,500. Ooh. And he was out. But um, under Stansfield Turner, the government decided to release that information about MKUltra, and they notified the 86 institutions that had participated, many of them unknowingly. I mean, Georgetown University Hospital was one of them. Right. We have a headline on the back cover of our book, uh, Friday, August 26, 1977, from the New York Times saying, CIA tells Columbia and Princeton universities of secret behavioral research. So what are we to make from that, that many of these institutions didn't know that cooperation with the CIA was going on? The money was flowing to the researchers, uh, in many cases professors or doctors or psychiatrists, through dummy corporations that had been set up by the CIA. You know, nobody had a check saying they were paid by the CIA. Well, of course not. Uh, we found out that the project that we were guinea pigs in <clears throat> uh, was getting funding through, it was called the Society for the Study of Human Ecology. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows. What the, somebody made up that name, but it was the paymaster. And this is where Dr. Humphrey Osmond and... Uh, and his cohorts, such as Dr. Bernard Aronson, were, you know, were getting the funding for research that they felt, I, I want to emphasize, these were not evil people. They were not acting strictly under orders. They were continuing research in which they had particular interest, where they were trying to differentiate between the symptoms of schizophrenia, paranoia, in other words, madness. Right. And the, the, the symptoms, the effects of the psychedelic drugs. Psychedelic means mind manifesting. So you, I want you to understand these drugs were originally called psychotomimetic, <clears throat> mimicking psychosis. Excuse me. <clears throat> However, uh, Osman felt that because uh, he had ingested peyote with the um, Native American church, when he was a researcher up in Saskatchewan, Canada. He went from England to Saskatchewan and then came down to New Jersey to run the Bureau of Research of the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute. Um, So he's interested in the differentiation between psychiatric illness and what happens to a person who's taken a psychedelic drug. And that was really the motivation behind the project that uh, John Selby and I had enlisted in. Hmm. 
it used hypnosis. They called it uh, non-drug analogs to the psychedelic state, meaning using hypnosis to alter a sense of reality, to give a hypnotic condition that changes your perception of the world, by perhaps taking away depth perception or increasing it. Right. Or making time seem to flow faster or slower or time stops or you become six inches tall. And how do you perceive the environment around you? Do you withdraw into like a cocoon and in, 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 in a fetal position and behave like uh, a schizophrenic or under expanded depth? Do you have a state of elation, a sense of uh, peace and mystical union with the universe? You know, like the, the, the yogis report seeking mm -hmm. nirvana. This was what the thinking was that they were trying to sort out because it was the beginning of studies of psychedelics and not nearly as much was known about it then as now. It was also just before, I would say, the or right at the beginning of the massive distribution uh, throughout the country of LSD to, uh, you know, uh, what became the hippie movement. Yeah. And uh, you had Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters giving LSD to thousands of people in cities across the country. So the drug was declared illegal in 1966. And and uh, the brakes were put on research, but not at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute, where they used hypnosis. They used microdosing of LSD. Sometimes it would be a placebo. You might, a subject might think that he's under a psychedelic drug and he was given nothing. Uh, this was the study. Now, where we ran into trouble, and this is all in blowing America's mind because we, starting right after we got out of the program, we began recreating, documenting it all, wanting to have a book one day, but that was just the beginning of it way back then. It took us four decades to finish. We, um, we, we ran into trouble <clears throat> through the hypnotic conditions where they erased your memory of what happened during the session. Oh. It could have been a session... <clears throat> Excuse my cough. Sure. Could have been a session that lasted uh, three, four, or five hours. My heavens. And they, uh, would, they would train you in hypnosis for such a period of time with both the trigger word to get into the relaxed state and begin to go into a trance. Mm -hmm. And they would train you to go into deeper and deeper trances. You know, if you really deep trance, hypnosis can be used as an anesthetic. They could surgically operate on somebody when it's used effectively right and this was deep hypnosis and they could block your memory of what happened you'd wake up you'd be brought out of the trance you wouldn't remember what happened in the last four or five hours they promised to restore memory of all of these things that was part of the problem they didn't uh, some of them they did but particularly with John Selby he began to panic because he was sure that they never erased all these conditions he was seeing things happening in his life at the university. Uh, he was a champion fencer. Uh, it was affecting his fencing. It was affecting his love relationship, which you'll read about in the book. And um, when they assigned him to be my training hypnotist, there's one chapter in the book where I'm put under hypnosis, and he has a panic attack. Uh, he, he starts having remembering one of the conditions uh, of of being turned into a bird and told to fly away. And while he was gone in the body of a bird, there were uh, hypnotic conditions which changed his personality and his sense of reality and blocked a lot of his memories of his past, which just became wiped out. And he was sure that the condition was never erased. So he leaves me sleeping in the hypnosis room. And he runs upstairs in panic to Dr. Aronson, uh, saying, you never erased that condition. You never erased that condition. He was in a state. As I say, one flew over the cuckoo's nest mm -hmm. for real. All documented as to what happened. All uh, reconstructed and told in a novel style, rather than a treatise about uh, about MK Ultra. That's what we've done. How can the CIA 
conduct experimentation within the borders of the United States when it is strictly forbidden to do that? It is forbidden. This was this had to be an illegal uh, program, and that's why it was made. Uh, not it was not only top secret, but it mm-hmm. was untraceable, because uh, uh, the way the uh, movement of the money was hidden. Yeah. And uh, perhaps some of the researchers didn't know where the money was coming from. That's possible in some cases. Um, you know, they had research grants that were approved yeah. of things that the CIA was interested in that fit into this. Uh, and, you know, the CIA was also intimately involved in the remote viewing projects at Stanford University, considerably less dark. Right. And Jimmy Carter said that those research uh, experiments bore fruit, mm-hmm. that there were uh, cases where through remote viewing, uh, a downed plane in Africa that couldn't be located by any other means was located by a remote viewer. Jimmy Carter, you can find yep. the... Uh, uh, you know, the documentary footage of him uh, saying that. Jeffrey, so, please stand by, my friend. I hate to cut you off. This is a very, very right. important topic, and we'll get right back to it. Jeffrey Davids is our special guest this hour, XO Nation. He, along with um, John Selby, have written, uh, in my opinion, a blockbuster book, Blowing America's Mind, a true story of Princeton, CIA, mind control, LSD, and Zen. And his website is www.blowingamericasmind.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network www.xzbn.net ABS Media The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're talking about Blowing America's Mind. It's a great new book. It's, uh, it's a, ta- a true story of Princeton, CIA mind control, LSD, and Zen. The book is written by John Selby and our guest this hour, Paul Jeffrey Davids. Their website, www.blowingamericasmind.com. So before we went to the uh, break for the news, we were talking about how President Jimmy Carter actually said that uh, the uh, c- the remote viewing had bore fruit. And yeah. was this uh, was this the same uh, remote viewing that Russell Targ had been involved with? Yes. Yes. You probably know the names of some of the other uh, main uh, remote viewers in that uh, Stanford uh, program escapes my mind yeah. at the moment. But uh, that that was part of this. Hmm. And I, I'm sure that Jimmy Carter made that statement, uh, you know, when he was an ex-president. Yeah. So, and it was, I think it was on an airplane. Uh, it's, someone asked him a question about it, and he answered off the cuff. It was very interesting. And I'm sure that, I mean, I suppose that there was a lot of helpful information gleaned from these studies. Right. Uh, even though they had a dark side. But um, there were people harmed by this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you mentioned the case of your mother. Yes. Uh, and there were um, you know, thousands of mm-hmm. people who were experimented on. In our case, we gave consent. We were made to sign a disclaimer. Um, and, and I was, you know, it must have been 20 at the time. I had to get my parents' permission. They right. didn't want to give it. I had to talk them into it. Well, let me ask you, if your parents or if you would have known it was um, a project or research funded by the CIA, would you have agreed? It would have scared me off for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, it would have scared me off. Because what attracted me to it was the reputation of Dr. Humphrey Osmond. Yes. A couple more words about uh, Dr. Osmond, who, who has a very strong reputation. Mm-hmm. He was a friend of author Aldous Huxley, great writer, philosopher. I think his most famous book is The Brave New World. Um, well, Dr. Osmond turned on Aldous Huxley uh, with mescaline. And from that experience, which was a very positive one for Aldous Huxley, as Osmond guided him, uh, Huxley wrote the book, uh, The Doors of Perception, which is the best accounting we have of a psychedelic uh, experience, I think, that anybody has, mm-hmm. has, has written, because he had a profound uh, experience that, in fact, in, it, it influenced him his whole life. He later took LSD, and in fact, Timothy Leary told me when I, I made a film about Timothy Leary uh, that uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, when he was dying, asked for LSD, so he would go out under LSD, and that's what happened. He was given it by his wife. Um, so that you know, Osmond having that background, those associations, friend of Timothy Leary when he was a professor at Harvard, I think. Then Leary was fired. Yeah. But um, I was drawn to be in the program. And the, everyone I've talked to about it has asked me, well, you know, do you have regrets? Uh, was, uh, you know, do you wish you'd never done it? And I always say it was a, a two edged sword. There was a dark side to it because some of those hypnotic conditions uh, did induce, uh, you know, the terrible, uh, state of mind, mm-hmm. which, which, uh, which, which was akin to like, uh, split personality, schizophrenia, uh, uh, dark things and, 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 and a negative psychic state, psychological state. Uh, there were the positive experiences some of the experiences, you know, that I had with LSD then were extremely profound. Such as? And, well, I, well, I had experiences like those that uh, Aldous Huxley had described for mescaline in the Doors of Perception. Hmm. By the way, that's where Jim Morrison got the the name for his band, The Doors. It's from that book. You know, he read that book. Uh, he was uh, promoting the psychedelics then. The Beatles yeah. were. Um, it was sweeping across the country. So, no, I had some good experiences. I had some bad experiences. But the, I think the 
the most positive thing about it, one of the reasons I don't regret it, is I was headed on the wrong path for me at that time for my future. I was a psychology major, mm-hmm. and I was pre-med. I was wanting to become a psychiatrist. I wanted to be the next Humphrey Osmond at that time. I was not cut out to be the next Humphrey Osmond. And I had another passion in my life that started when I was in elementary school, and that was making movies, specifically special effects films. I mean, when I was a kid, I started making my own monster movies, horror movies, science fiction, eight millimeter, (laughs) silent, animation, stop motion, dragons, dinosaurs, uh, building robots. My friends and I, particularly a friend named Jeff Tinsley, you know, we made 30, 40 of these little movies, which we still have. They were some of them were incorporated into my my film released by Universal called The Sci-Fi Boys that Peter Jackson helped me with. But that's really what I wanted to do in life. I wanted to make movies, but I was discouraged from that by everyone in the straight world in which I grew up, uh, where, you know, the advice was get yourself a stable profession. Mm. You never know if there's going to be another pr- uh, depression. Yeah. Choose being a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, a teacher, work for the government. Don't think of going to Hollywood and immersing yourself in a world where you have no contacts or, or no relatives. You won't benefit from nepotism. But I rebelled against all that. You know, when you're a hypnotic subject in a situation like this, you are, for a certain number of hours, you're under the control of other people who are manipulating you. And with both John Selby and I, there came a point in our relationship with the Institute where we really rebelled against this manipulation and control. And we had to fight to keep our own center and our own identity and we each broke with the Institute at different times. It's part of the story in Blowing America's Mind. He broke first and warned me I should get out of the program. It was causing all kinds of problems for him. I didn't listen to him. I stayed on. It took me you know, another six or eight months to come around to uh, his way of thinking and leave the Institute. And when I asserted myself uh, that way, I, I felt you know, I didn't want anybody to control me. I don't want to be controlled by my parents or my peer group or, you know, the community I grew up in. I got one life to live. I want to work in the movies. And so it gave me the strength to go through that whole process, and that's what I did. I I was accepted at the American Film Institute Center for Advanced Film Studies, one of their first 15 students, unfellowship, at the Doheny Mansion in Beverly Hills. I went from Princeton to Beverly Hills to study film under fantastically favorable circumstances. I found the doors of Hollywood after a few years opened up to me. I've had a long career. I've directed and produced about 10 films. They've been shown around the world, mainly television through NBC Universal. You know, I produced uh, executive producer of Showtime for Roswell. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that I was one of the key guys that started the Transformers. Uh, the Transformers started as cartoons. Yes. From Marvel. Yeah. Well, I was the exec. I, I was the production coordinator at Marvel for seventy nine episodes. <laughs> seventy nine half hours have my name blazoned across the TV screen, and I wrote a lot of those. So I was at Marvel. I worked on Lie Detector for F. Lee Bailey, you know, where I met Betty Hill and psychic Dorothy Allison. Uh, And then I got a contract from George Lucas to write six of the Star Wars sequel books with my wife. We we wrote The Glove of Darth Vader all the way through Prophets of the Dark Side, sold millions of copies. And then I started making all these movies about different subjects I was intensely interested in, you know, from Jesus in India and the sci-fi boys and... I'm an artist. Van Gogh interested me passionately, so I, I, I did Starry Night. And I mentioned the biography of Timothy Leary called Timothy Leary's Dead. It played in Toronto. Huge success at the Toronto Film Festival. And I had that relationship with Timothy Leary because I'd worked with Humphrey Osmond. You know, I, I approached him. I was advised by his publisher he, that Timothy was dying in 1995. He had cancer. No one had made a story of his life. I went to him. I found the the, the funding, mm-hmm. 
and uh, we made that film about the life of Timothy Leary. I, I tackled the li Life After Death project, a study of is there life after death? Uh, did I mention Jesus in India? Yeah. My latest film, Marilyn Monroe Declassified, about uh, the mystery of the death of Marilyn Monroe. I even, in a Catholic-oriented film, not a Catholic, but I was fascinated by the purported miracle of the Virgin of Guadalupe, Mexico, which is so important among Hispanic Americans. And based on a stage play, I made a movie called Before We Say Goodbye uh, about that miracle and the, and, the, and the family that believed in that miracle. So I chose the projects, the subjects. Universal helped me getting them out to the world. You know, you, you know, when I when I told my parents I wasn't even going to apply to medical school after having done well on the medical boards, my mother called up my aunt and said, he's throwing his life away. You know? So, Rob, I've just told you how I threw my life away, right? Well, to That's me, how I've spent my life. Well, to me, the way that your life has affected millions of people around the world in such a positive way. Thank you. Thank Kudos you to much. you, and uh, thank you for... For following your dream and following your heart, because you, I've said this, you know, to my staff tonight before we went on air, I said, you have made a positive difference. You have given people hope and you have given people the opportunity to believe in the unbelievable. So thank you for that. Thank you. You and I yes. have to take our final you know, break, my friend. Ro we'll be back. Ro Roswell, which is controversial to this day. I know you've had guests on who uh, promoted as yeah. an extraterrestrial event and those who say it wasn't. But... Well, let's talk about that when we come back. Let's do that. All right. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Paul Jeffrey Davids. He, along with John Selby, have written what I call a blockbuster, Blowing America's Mind, a true story of Princeton, CIA mind control, LSD, and Zen. And their website is www.blowingamericasmind.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon. Don't go away. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon radio show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at Elizabeth.Joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork will take you from 1899 
to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Exonation Paul Jeffrey Davids is my guest. He, along with John Selby, have written Blowing America's Mind, a true story of Princeton, CIA mind control, LSD, and Zen. The website is www.blowingamericasmind.com. First of all, uh, Paul, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, please thank thank uh, John for from everyone here for the two of us, two of you combining your talents and getting this book out there. I'm sure it's going to raise a lot of questions and people will start looking at the world in a different way when they understand that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and we really never know at times who the man behind the curtain is. So thank you for that. Thank you. And before we go back to the mm-hmm. subject that you wanted to raise, you mentioned Roswell, yeah. but I wanted to say about John Selby, that uh, he became a very accomplished uh, writer, um, published so many times. Mm -hmm. I think he has about 40 books out there. And uh, he has uh, written uh, self-help books, uh, popular psychology, books of philosophy, Seven Masters, One Path, which I think came from Harper's, uh, is one of his, his books. He's written books about marijuana, I think The Mindful Marijuana User, even uh, the belly book <clears throat> about uh, men becoming middle-aged and coming to terms with having a beer belly. Uh, so he's been very prolific, also writes mystery stories, adventure stories, wrote PowerPoint book for uh, Warner Brothers. Hmm. So, uh, and he's had a life of adventure. He's been in, in Germany where he ran psychological programs, uh, South Africa. He lived for many years on the island of Kauai. Now he lives near Silicon Valley. So we we lost touch through some of the years, but always got back in touch. And this book was always the unfinished manuscript, sitting in a drawer, gathering dust that we couldn't quite bring ourselves to put out, Rob, because we were both having very successful independent careers. I was doing my movies. Life was going well. Uh, you know, I wasn't... Uh, I didn't have the kind of concerns in my life that Mm -hmm. writing this book about the CIA's mind control could bring to me. Um, He was doing really well, and he felt uh, concern about what would it mean to publish this book at long last, in which he is so vulnerable. I mean, you just see inside the guy. of the. If if those of you who grew up, I don't know, with, with, with having to read The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. You know, you got to know Holden Caulfield so well, everything about him. And that, John Selby does that in this book for who he was at that time. He was a misfit at Princeton. He grew up on a cattle ranch. He was a cowboy at Princeton. We were as different as two people could possibly be. Me, the son of a scholar and professor, and him coming off of a cattle ranch. And yet, the bond that we felt... Because we had both gone through this revelatory experience at the Institute and nightmare combined. It kept us together. If 40 years later, we talked and said, look, we're not young men anymore. You know, I mean, uh, 70 years old, okay? Right. And I think he's 71 now. And we said, okay, so we need to have a bucket list, right? Mm-hmm. What do you want to finish before you check out? I want this book out there. I think it's a piece of literature we left unfinished. I think the story needs to be untold. He, he, he told. He, he agreed with me completely. And so in 2017, we did what was necessary to pull the writing together, uh, to fill in the missing pieces, the things about MK Ultra that we had never known way back when, uh, to write an epilogue that took the story into our present lives and get it out there. And Rob, it's just been out for a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, blowing America's mind. Um, you're in Canada, so I, you know, people should look on Amazon. You can find it as a print book. Or you can find it as a Kindle ebook. If you have other ebook readers, you know, you can find those too in other formats from Barnes and Noble and other people that put out ebooks. It's widely out there now if you look for it, and it's it's 
It just come out. So it's a fulfillment of like a 40 plus year project for us. I understand. And uh, that's, that's, that's how it came about. One quick question. Um, is LSD going to make a comeback, especially now with all the different laws and regulations that are being, I don't know what the law is anymore with Donald, uh, with uh, Jeff Sessions changing what uh, President Obama did to the different states yeah. that have legalized it for medical use or recreational use. But in your opinion, is LSD going to make a comeback? Well, it already has made a comeback. I mean, you, if you su- do a search online, mm-hmm. you'll see articles that have been written about among the young. Uh, LSD uh, is being used now more than it has in decades. Um, uh, you know, people working in, in industry, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, you know, are microdosing themselves with LSD as an aid to their work. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, Steve Jobs... Uh, you know, has uh, been very, very clear that his experience with LSD was one of the pivotal things that he said awakened him in a way that he was able to uh, conceive of technological things and also the kind of design things that he contributed uh, to Apple. And Steve Wozniak, I think, seconded mm-hmm. that, you know, computer inventor. Now, not to say that LSD is... Uh, always safe. Right. Not to say anybody's recommending self-experimentation. Um, can you have a bad trip that has repercussions? Of course. Um, but I think it's a huge exaggeration to say, as I think Reader's Digest once did, that you know taking LSD on your own is like uh, trying to be your own brain surgeon and operating on yourself. <laughs> no, no, not really. A lot of the scare stories are are, are bunk. But sure you need are. guidance. You need a guide. You need someone who's experienced who can help you if you go through the experience, and it's still illegal. So if you're getting LSD from some source, how do you know that it's uh, pure? Yeah, exactly. How do you know? You know, we're in a very difficult situation because research was cut off or made top secret. We wouldn't know that. But for, you know, the last decades... Research grants in this area were not approved. The drugs were not made available. Even with marijuana, the research has been extremely limited during the past decades. And we're just beginning to catch up. We thought we were at the cusp of a new era. And certainly the economics of marijuana legalization would indicate we already have entered that new era. Um, Jeff Sessions, you know, just threw a monkey wrench into things because sure banks did. are going to back off now on mm-hmm. uh, marijuana uh, commerce. However, um, that law still exists on the books uh, in, in as a federal law of the United States uh, on marijuana. And marijuana is still classified, like LSD, as a Schedule One drug equal to heroin, mm-hmm. which in my humble opinion is ridiculous. It's outrageous. But if it's in it that class... It should have been changed. It hasn't been changed. That's because it's the, easier to control if it's a class one drug than it is in a, in a lesser category, and the government can use it to their advantage anytime they want. Oh. Well, mainly it's been used for two different types of advantages through the years. One is to be able to arrest people that they target, yep. that they happen to know use it. And there's a long litany of people, not just Timothy Leary with his five years in prison for a joint... Um, Ken Kesey, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Sometimes a Great Notion. Uh, I think he was uh, sentenced to five years, or he faced five years. Maybe that was commuted uh, for uh, possession of a couple of joints. And it's been used uh, for, you know, arresting a disproportionate number of black people, Hispanic people, people of color. Um, so it's it's been like a weapon, Uh that's been used a social weapon, a control mechanism to have it against the law, as it is. Uh, I I, I don't know where it's going, but I think that maybe the climate is right now to try to get a vote in Congress to legalize it. It needs to be legalized, in my opinion. I think that's where it's going. You can't continue to exist as a society, as a united states, if 29 states have this as legal, that's right. And all the rest, plus the federal government, say schedule one drug, absolutely verboten, 
we'll send you to jail if we catch you with it. You see, what happens? Crazy, crazy, what, crazy. What happens up here in Canada is if it and when it is decriminalized, it goes right across the board. Up here, it is the federal government that regulates that type of, of drug. So okay. if the federal government says, well, we're decriminalizing it now, it's available for recreation and medical, bang, that's it. It's legal right across the country. A are you pro- saying it is now, or are you saying if it is? If it is. and it's, this? It certainly yeah. looks like it will be very shortly. Oh, well, that, that will be interesting development in Canada. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, was go- I was going point. to ask you about Roswell. I've got a minute left. What can you tell us within a minute? Well, what, well, I know you've had a lot of skeptics on your show. Yeah. I made the movie. I'm convinced. I'm convinced on Roswell. Extraterrestrial, my opinion, for whatever it's worth. But not just my opinion. It's uh, the opinion of astronaut Gordon Cooper, who mm-hmm. met with me privately on it. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who walked on the moon, yep. who met with me privately about it. I have funneled information that I received directly to Bill Clinton, who was my father's student. Of uh, I think very helpful information. Certainly everything the Pentagon has put out about it is disinformation. It was no mogul balloon, weather balloon. No. And I've heard directly from uh, soldiers who were there who saw bodies. We have an affidavit from uh, Walter Hout that there were um, bodies involved of people, that, of the beings that were not human. Listen, we're going to have to have you back that's on. That's what it was as far as I'm concerned. Cover we're going, up, cover we're up. going to have to have you back on one time to talk about Roswell, the UFOs, and life after death, and, and Jesus in India. But until then, thank you so much for writing Blowing America's Mind, and I wish you and John Selby continued success, and thank you for all you do. Thank you for having me aboard. I really appreciate it. You take care, Exo Nation. For more information, visit www.blowingamericasmind.com. I'll be back on the other side of the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exo. Don't go away. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. 
Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D O W S E R S dot com or call 1 877 Dowsing. That's 1 877 369 7464.